Hi, this is Greg Gornert of Gornert Wealth Management, and this is my Insights and Perspectives podcast. Welcome to Insights and Perspectives, If I Knew Then, the show where we share the stories of the successes and challenges that entrepreneurs overcome on a daily basis as they build extraordinary businesses. We celebrate their triumphs both personally and professionally, learn from their setbacks, and reflect on what they've discovered about themselves. In this month's interview, I'll be joined by Vern Friesen, founder and retired president of Bakerview Forest Products. If you were to go back and you give younger Vern Friesen one piece of advice, what would you tell him? An experience is uh, is the best teacher. I had a lot of uh, a lot of close calls. Hi, and welcome to the October first edition of my Insights and Perspectives podcast. Now, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about. First of all, we've got Tony Dwyer coming out to Vancouver at 5 p.m. on October 24th. Now, seating is limited, so reserve your spot with me as soon as possible. Now, we're still getting some great comments back from my Corey Churko interview, and one of the things that seems to be coming up was my history of Fed independence and why I didn't mention Paul Volcker under Reagan. After all, he almost doubled the overnight interest rate to 20% in March 1980, eased them back in June of the same year, but raised them back to 20% in December and kept them there above 16% until May 1981, leading to the Volcker shock and the 1981 recession. But the majority of the damage was done under the Carter administration, as Reagan wasn't inaugurated until the third week of January in 1981. Reagan, in fact, reappointed him in 1983. The real challenge to Fed independence came in the summer of 1984, on the eve of the presidential election, when, as Volcker describes in his book, Keeping at It, he was summoned to the White House, and instead of meeting in the Oval Office, he met with Reagan and his chief of staff, Jim Baker, in the library. Now, Baker did the talking, while Reagan sat there uncomfortably. Baker said, the president is ordering you not to raise interest rates before the election. Volcker walked out without saying a word. Ironically, he had had no intention of raising interest rates anyways, as market conditions didn't warrant it. He was still disturbed by the attempt at interference nonetheless. Also, if you haven't checked out my October newsletter, I've included it in the link below. In it, I note the passing of Cars founder and lead vocalist Rick Ocasek and parallel the extended run of disco in the 70s to the current extended bull market. As we discussed on September 15th, an inverted yield curve means at some point a recession is coming, but not quite today, even despite the potential of a Trump impeachment trial. Now, to the interview. My guest today is a founder of Bakerview Forest Products, Vern Friesen. Welcome, Vern. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Vern, can you take, I've known you for a long time, but I've always loved your story about Bakerview. Can you take me back to the beginning when you first started getting into the forest industry? Yeah, I, um, I got my first interview uh, from um, a lumber broker here in uh, 1978. Um, Cooper Widman was uh, the name of the company, and uh, they were owned by Northwood Mills. Uh, great, uh, it was a huge corporation. Uh, they uh, they had a floor and a half of the Bentall Center, um, and I don't know why I was being interviewed, but I I found out later that uh, there were seven of their top traders had left to form their own company, which is Tega Forest Products, uh, and still doing a very successful business right now. And they were looking to, to uh, fill the seats, uh, for, uh, to, to fill the void. And um, uh, I, was look, I was always looking around for something that would, I was work, looking for a commission job and uh, like um, pay me for what the hard work I put in, not just the salary. So um, this uh, looked like a real opportunity for me. Uh, the, uh, um, I admitted that I didn't know anything about lumber. I, uh, I'm from the prairies. Uh, I know a piece of plywood from a two by four, and that's what I told them. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, I, I guess they just were willing to give me a shot. 
And uh, that was, um, I, I did get the job. I had to give up a company car. I had to take a reduction in salary, of course. It was pretty hard uh, living on that for a while because, uh, you know, like all young kids, we all have debts and, uh, you know, there we go. But the first week was awesome. Uh, well, getting, just getting back to my interview uh, where I, when I was accepted, uh, the, uh, I, uh, Dave Shaysgreen is the, is the name of the, uh, the guy that interviewed me and he uh, had been in the business forever and well known to everybody. And he said, your biggest uh, um, challenge will be to deal with the tax man. You'll be making so much money. So, which sounded really good to that me. That sounds, sounds awesome. Yeah. At least the first part sounds awesome. Exactly. The tax and then, part uh, sounds you know, awesome. jump forward here uh, six, eight months, and then we got uh, past the 78 upside. We got to the 1978 downside, which is just, it was brutal. But it was good, uh, it was a good beginning because I stuck with it and um, was able to uh, get through some other hard times at uh, the cyclical part of, of the lumber industry. Uh, it was, um, uh, they, uh, because of the economy, they, uh, they decided to downsize and I got transferred uh, uh, to, well, I was offered a, a place in Winnipeg, one of their, their warehouses and uh, uh, lumber yards in, in Winnipeg, which was a good fit. Um, my wife at that time was from Winnipeg. I was from uh, the, around there. Uh, the, prairie, the prairie connection was, was just, uh, a no fail thing uh, by the looks of things but I uh, I once I got out there I was in there six or eight months and I just missed that trading back and forth getting up at being at my desk at six in the morning and here it's uh, altogether different you just it's I became an order taker and uh, it was not what I was looking for so I um, I made uh, connections back on the West Coast, and long story short, I ended up moving back, moving the whole family back, selling the house over there, buying a new house over this side, and um, uh, started working for a place called Widman Industries. And um, uh, there again, we're still fighting a, a, a downturn in the market, but there were some hot spots which uh, I was able to maintain a, a decent living. And uh, the uh, as it uh, as these things happen, uh, they were Woodman Industries was bought out by uh, Ralph S. Plant, which is uh, the same uh, company that Steve Power was working for at, okay. at one time. Okay. And uh, so um, I was I became uh, one of the uh, traders in Ralph S. Plant, and uh, which uh, became uh, quite good. I it was uh, I would I had success over there as well, but then. Um, I can't remember uh, what happened with with that situation. Whether I think I made a, a move on my own to uh, I had I had an opportunity uh, to buy into a small company, three guys investing in in a in fifty percent of um, a company called Orchards and Lumber, uh, which uh, they had. Um, a sawmill. They had financial backing, so it was uh, it was good. I just uh, I need just needed to do what I was doing and sell and trade lumber, and uh, so that went. Uh, uh, I made the move for that. It was only from from a floor and a half in the Bentall Center to uh, three guys in a secretary uh, like that. Um, uh, so what was that like? Is that I mean that's a big move. Yeah. Obviously going from the real corporate world company to big company to just three uh, yep what, what, what kind of office was it I, I uh, like both sides I, I like the big uh, company there because um, it would gave you a lot of opportunity uh, to do well you can if things uh, went sideways for a while you could hide for a while in, in the big company and so <laughs> uh, uh, in the smaller one not so much but uh, the uh, the smaller uh, office was Great. It um, we everybody worked hard. We had all set goals for ourselves, uh, and uh, we became quite a, a good working family. Uh, the uh, the two major uh, shareholders in the, in uh, that my investment there. Um, I only own ten percent, so I couldn't afford any more. So <laughs> um, they became quite <clears throat> how should I say uh, competitive with each other. 
mm -hmm. uh, and it became a, a, a negative thing in the office, and uh, it, uh, it it created hostility, and it got so bad uh, there that uh, I had to uh, uh, get out of that situation because I could feel uh, I was uh, feeling anx anxiety to uh, to an extreme, which uh, really so com competitive in what way was it like bigger uh, sales numbers or what was it? Uh, just yeah, they would the competitive uh, tension within the office. Or? Yeah, big time. They would uh, cut each other down in uh, in buying. They, there was so much money involved in buying, so much money involved in selling. Uh, there was always a feud between you bought this, I didn't buy that. Uh, you didn't sell that, I sold that, and oh. uh, and inventory uh, getting credit for selling in the inventory uh, became uh, almost a daily uh, fight with um, some of these, uh, well, b uh, both of those guys. So I had to get out, and I uh, I uh, got paid out. Uh, I think my share was worth at that time uh, twenty eight thousand dollars, which at that time was a fair amount of cash. Yeah, what year was this? Uh, I'm going to say nineteen eighty one. Okay, so yeah, that's that's quite a big chunk back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Um, it's good, and uh, the interest rates were like twenty percent, eighteen to twenty percent. It was uh, wow. the mortgage rates were really yeah. tough. And uh, <clears throat> so it was. Um, so I decided to uh, to take the summer off. I, I looked at different things, uh, d different industries uh, to go into that um, would. Um, I don't know uh, the lumber industry after being where out of the situation and where I where I came out of it wasn't um, didn't seem to me uh, that was the route to go anymore. But um, I did get uh, calls from. Uh, my customers after they uh, after they uh, uh, found out that, that I was no longer in that office, to seeing what was going on. So uh, I just told them, and uh, and I got to think about that, and uh, I got man, that's um, that I could still make a good living uh, getting back into the lumber industry. And I figured, well, uh, I did that for about uh, five or six months, and I figured if if I can make it like just strictly commission. I should be doing this on my own and uh, getting uh, the 100% the of the profit. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I uh, went to one of my uh, smaller suppliers um, here to see whether I could get supplies from him if I uh, went on my own. Mm -hmm. And when I, in my meet, uh, the meeting with this uh, Intermountain Forest Products uh, became, uh, yeah, he would be my supplier. But uh, we formed a company called Baker V Forest Products. Oh, so that's how it came about then. Okay, so yeah. you made a made a partnership with your supplier. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he wasn't a big car. He wasn't a McMillan Bodell or uh, Interfor or any of those. It was just a it was just a remanufacturing plant. Uh, and uh, so he had, had dry kilns. He had uh, uh, lumber working equipment, uh, resaw, planer, and that type of thing. So, which was, uh, it became uh, a real asset for me to be there. I had a small little office that, uh, that was just uh, a little hole in the wall. And uh, I did all the invoicing, uh, did all the, uh, everything to do with it. Uh, I did the initial bookkeeping for the accountant, um, you know, and bank reports and like that. And uh, it, uh, it was just a, like a one-man show pretty well. Uh, it became very, uh, very lucrative after a while for on both sides for Intermountain Forest Products because I used their facilities mm -hmm. to run all my lumber through, and for Bakerview Forest Products itself, um, there uh, it, it uh, I, according to our accountant, I made Intermountain Forest Products a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I was with this uh, uh, this fellow for Bob for eight years, uh, and he taught me a lot about uh, the lumber itself, how to get the best and the most out of lumber, how to, how to glean uh, uh, a higher grade out of uh, poor grade lumber, um, and uh, it, was, it was really a, a good learning curve. The other part that I learned from him is uh, how not to treat human beings, because he was socially a very, um, uh, he was a bully. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to everybody around him, and I had to be very careful that he didn't. Uh, uh, I didn't come under that 
that affliction that he had on on uh, his employees, uh, bankers, anybody that uh, didn't ride a didn't ride a forklift or do anything with lumber, he was no good. So uh, I had to had to walk that line for for quite a while. In a way, it. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, eventually, after eight years, I bought him out. I went strictly on my own, moved the office, of course. What year would this be? Uh, 1982. Oh, so that wasn't that, oh, 1982, so? Yeah. Okay. But, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it, on that date, um, uh, it was, uh, times were still really, really uh, not good. Uh, right. You know, the uh, world economy was trying to recover, but, uh, but my expenses were low. Uh, mm -hmm. All I had to uh, pay for was my salary and the phone bill. Right. And uh, uh, that was uh, the rent in the on the office was uh, was minimal. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, uh, it was a good uh, it was a good time to move. And uh, I knew how to go uh, treat uh, myself uh, as far as uh, getting through the hard times because mm -hmm. I'd been through uh, many times before. And you just keep your head down. Um, no expenses, no un unnecessary expenses, and uh, just keep plugging on the phones and selling yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked out. Um, uh, in about, oh, I was in there on my own for about six or eight months and just plugging along, doing well, and computers were just starting to come out then. So uh, I did eventually get one. I didn't know what to do with it, <laughs> but uh, it looked good on my desk. Uh, but it, um, I, did, uh, I did hire a, a a computer lady that to put uh, most of my data on uh, on some kind of a uh, memory thing, so I, I could um, hopefully bring up the past of how much sales I had of this type of thing and that mm -hmm. type of thing, and where I uh, could do better. But uh, it was uh, it was a slow go. So um, after um, two or three months, I I nixed that and uh, and I went to a. Um, uh, um, like a, a, a business class where uh, I could uh, I could learn about uh, employees, learn about um, where the business should go, um, just basic uh, business stuff, and uh, it uh, gave me a, a new outlook on uh, on what I should do because uh, at that time I was indestructible. I was um, in my uh, early forties uh, and. Uh, you know, physically in really good shape, and uh, uh, I, um, I, but, you know, getting, uh, I can't do this forever, you know, you're going to be in a wheelchair uh, still selling lumber, and I, you know, there's got to be an end game. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, that planted the seed for that, and I did get my first employee, a trader, that he was a novice, um, didn't know uh, uh, too much about uh, lumber, but he had a his family was a lumber background, so um, you know I went with that, and he was a nice guy. Um, and then uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, I was um, I was approached by uh, somebody in in the industry that I knew well. I did business with him, uh, and Glenn, and uh, <clears throat> we decided to uh, uh, form a company. He wanted to buy in a, a company somewhere, and uh, so. He, uh, him, and I decided that we could we could go ahead uh, together. We um, we uh, formed a 50-50 uh, contract, mm -hmm. uh, signed everything legally. Uh, went through a lot of uh, contingency uh, scenarios that uh, hopefully would uh, would cover any uh, negative stuff that uh, that comes up with partnerships and. Uh, so we're all uh, good to go, and uh, and then we hit the uh, the market um, with this. It was a big shock to a lot of people because uh, Glenn was well known, um, and uh, we uh, hit the uh, up market. Um, it was uh, he was uh, mainly selling into the U.S. Of course, uh, like uh, the history uh, shows it that. Um, the countervailing duty was always seemed to be uh, every other year, so the U.S. was um, not the place where I wanted to butt my head against anymore. But uh, Glenn uh, did well there, and he kept going in that direction. I, I was going more offshore, like Australia, Japan, um, Europe, uh, and I started uh, selling on 
markets overseas, which uh, this customer that I got in Japan was, uh, I, I always uh, say this to my wife that um, uh, this guy uh, helped pay for a place in the country. It was, uh, <laughs> we did so much business with this guy yeah. and it, uh, so much of it was just, uh, um, just with a handshake over the phone and right. uh, it, was, it was just awesome. So was this specialty lumber? <clears throat> yeah, it was Western Red Cedar, mm -hmm. and our company was pretty well all red Western Red Cedar, and uh, most of it was uh, higher grades, like um, uh, clear grades, which uh, the, uh, the European and uh, over Japan, Japanese market and like that, they, they were uh, really wild for this stuff. He really, really liked um, our, our product here. The other one they really liked was uh, uh, from us was um, the hemlock, which resembled part of their native tree, which they were restricted in cutting, I think. But uh, the uh, hemlock was a nice white color, uh, uh, not too bad to work with, and uh, a lot of hemlock went over to Japan hmm. uh, in the higher grades, of course, there again. And also uh, Alaska yellow cedar, which uh, was uh, had another higher price uh, again over Western Red Cedar. It was just uh, uh, one of those uh, things that caught on. It, cedar used to be a weed, the same as hemlock. Uh, they, uh, they cut it down and burned it uh, way oh, wow. back when. Yeah, it was just got in the way. But it uh, became, uh, it, uh, Western Red Cedar became a, a competitor to uh, the um, redwood, uh, which was uh, uh, getting in a diminishing uh, supply area because of um, uh, just this, it, it's such a small area where it comes from. There's not not too much uh, available there. So that's interesting. The evolution. So you, you're saying that uh, Western Red Cedar was a was a, in effect a substitute for for other woods. Going, you know. Yeah. It uh, well when they were cutting a uh, uh, attractive forest, uh, mm -hmm. they wanted the spruce. They wanted the pine. Uh, that's the, that was their uh, bread and butter. They would cut that into framing lumber. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other, uh, you know, they'd always glean the, the clears out of there, which would be like guitar grade or, or like scaffolding grade, which had a certain, like, and uh, uh, there was some uh, structural uh, uh, grades that uh, they could use for different spans from, uh, but the spruce pine fir. But uh, the cedar, uh, uh, started to catch on, and I don't know the exact origin, and I don't know exactly why, but it, it became quite, uh, quite popular overseas, mm -hmm. especially in Europe and uh, Japan, and uh, it, uh, it really became a very valuable uh, piece of uh, the, the whole lumber picture. Hmm. And consequently, Macmillan Boldale had uh, two or three mills, uh, just strictly Western Red Cedar, same with uh, BC Forest products at that time, they were called uh, later on, Intervor. But uh, they, uh, it, uh, Western Red Cedar supported a lot of families here that's uh, in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. so, so now you've got the partnership, you've got the house in the country, where do you go from there? My uh, business partner at that time, uh, uh, he, he uh, started uh, thinking in different lines of our agreements. So uh, saying that he, uh, he was going to, I don't know, work from home and uh, not come to the office so much, uh, which um, uh, it, uh, I got very negative vibes uh, on, our, on our relationship mm -hmm. uh, there. So consequently, uh, I uh, uh, I, I tried to move, think in, in different lines as to where Bakerview would end up, like and where Vern Friesen would end up, you know. Because right. uh, how many employees did you have at that time? There was you, uh, your partner? Oh, we had, well, in the office itself, uh, probably about six, I mm -hmm. think. But we had uh, satellite offices uh, in um, California, Florida, uh, Vancouver Island, um, later on in Ontario. Uh, in that uh, we would, uh, they would sell under Bakerview name, we would do the invoicing, uh, but they would run their own business and we would just uh, finance them and hopefully make a profit from these right. guys. So you had a lot going on then. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah it, was, uh, it was a lot going on. 
and uh, but it wasn't not uh, it was uh, did not get uh, did not get out of hand or anything. It was uh, that that part was good. The one <laughs> we did have a star employee that uh, that caused us uh, some anxiety uh, anxiety because uh, it was a female and she did very well. She mm -hmm. uh, she was a real hot shot and. Uh, after a while, she the dog was wagging the tail, and uh, we, between Glenn and I, uh, we a lot of times, uh, you know, we we had to bite our tongue, and because she was doing so well, uh, we uh, we made certain concessions, which uh, looking back, uh, that I'd never do. That was one of the regrets, uh, hmm. because uh, well, if you take like a child, you give them an inch, and they take uh, right. whatever they can. So, and that was the case here, and. She, uh, I was. She didn't come to me so often, but uh, Glenn was more of a, a softy in that way, and uh, got more concessions that way. So, long, end of it. Uh, she, uh, she quit and uh, formed her own company, uh, which happens a lot in the lumber industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we, uh, there was a lawsuit. She figured uh, that we owed her more money than she got, and blah blah blah. So it ended up. Uh, it was uh, it was a false accusation, and uh, we got out of there unscathed. And mm -hmm. and after that um, uh, it was all settled, uh, Glenn uh, had a complete change around, and uh, he made uh, overtures to buy me out. Okay. So uh, and uh, the we, uh, just at this time we had uh, the countervailing duty. We got most of our money back that we had paid into it mm -hmm. from the U.S. Treasury. So, which afforded him to be able to get the cash to buy me out. It was like a perfect storm. I couldn't ask for anything better mm -hmm. than that. Otherwise, I would have had to stay in the office, and he would have had to finance, and right. uh, you know, it would have been a different picture. But it was. Uh, it made it a real clean break. Um, and uh, February, uh, can't remember the exact date in February, but uh, uh, I was 63 years old, and uh, signed the papers. Uh, made sure the money was transferred in my bank account and uh, headed off with my wife uh, to Palm Springs. I remember you telling me that story. You were in the car right <laughs> after that, driving down to Palm Springs. And we usually, uh, in pre we had gone down be previously, um, but uh, this time we're, there was no hurry to get there. Uh, we took, instead of two uh, Two days, uh, we took three, and uh, even then we, we could have taken longer, but uh, it was a whole different scenario. We, uh, it, was, uh, it was like a big anvil that was lifted off my back. Wow. So I, sh I should bring up as well uh, that uh, earlier on when, uh, when I took on Glenn as a business partner, uh, and even before that, Darlene, uh, my wife, uh, uh, took a course in uh, bookkeeping, uh, almost like accounting type thing. She was the liaison between Bakerview and the, our accountants at that time. And she also took on uh, our own personal uh, uh, bookkeeping, uh, handling the finances there, and also Glenn's, which uh, he asked her to, t uh, to keep on. And we had other holding companies, which she did all of those. So she was taking care of uh, not only Bakerview, uh, doing the books for that, but also uh, two holding companies and two personal comp uh, uh, personal accounts uh, as well. So that's quite uh, a workload too. Yeah, yeah, she did, and uh, for a while she was doing it part time. She's still working at the bank, right? But uh, you know, I convinced her to quit because she was being run ragged and trying to look after families and all that too. Right. So it was um, uh, she did it full time. Um, so Interesting. Good, yeah. No, it's so important to have key people there that you can trust doing those things. Now, if you were to go back 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, and you give younger Vern Friesen one piece of advice, what would you tell him? Um, I, from the, stuff, from the, uh, the activities I had before getting into uh, business on my own, uh, I... Uh, an experience is uh, is the best teacher. I, I can't really give any <laughs> advice to a, a young kid that doesn't know uh, you know how to run a business, and I just kind of uh, 
went to the School of Hard Knocks and uh, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of close calls. Not a lot, but I had some close calls that uh, uh, I just, um, and I kept my head down, uh, kept my, uh, you know, my uh, hours at the desk uh, so that I could get everything, cross all the T's, dot all the I's, made sure everything was going. Uh, and I learned this later on. Uh, I could, could have done this sooner. I surrounded myself, because I did not, uh, I'm not uh, the person that is uh, as intelligent business-wise or accounting uh, or any of those things, I'm not intelligent enough to do all those things. So I surrounded my, uh, myself with uh, people that really knew their business. Like, uh, um, I think I got the best account accountant uh, available at that time, best lawyer. The bank uh, made sure that I treated them well and they treated me very well. They made, uh, matter of fact, after all was said and done, I took all of those guys out for lunch and I really thanked them for being on my side, um, for running, uh, helping me run uh, our, my business. and. Uh, like I say, uh, Darlene was a great asset uh, doing the books for everybody and uh, uh, it kept reins on uh, my spending, uh, my business partner's spending because uh, she handled that. And uh, so um, going back, uh, I, I would just say uh, know your limitations, uh, make sure you're, uh, 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 you're, you work hard and um, just surround yourself with people that you trust. And later on, I, um, uh, it wasn't even during uh, when I was running Bakerview, uh, the finances that uh, there were some extra finances and I got uh, the best finance guy in the business, which is Glenn Gor uh, Greg Gornard. And uh, I really uh, just uh, used the, uh, uh, the best guy and still is. Well, thank you very much. That was unexpected. <laughs> And now, one thing, you know, when we talk about uh, the forestry industry, I think it's fascinating. You've had a first-hand view of the evolution of the forest industry in British Columbia over the past 35 years, 40 years. All the changes and the common theme is that, as you said, there's, it seemed like every second year there was a countervailing duty. Uh, the industry, as we know, it's consolidated. Um, what are the biggest changes you've seen from back in 1978, you know, being on the floor of, you know, having a whole floor of, of uh, Bentall Center, being part of a forest company, to where you see it now, where it's, it's, it's a remarkably changed business? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of pressure on supply. Um, I, I see uh, mills closing uh, here just recently uh, because they haven't got uh, the timber to cut anymore, or it's too far to, far away to make it economical. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't just uh, plunk a sawmill anywhere. Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I can see the cost of lumber uh, because of that lack of supply uh, going up. It should, I mean, uh, if, there's, if there's not supply, uh, you know, there's more buyers than sellers, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna happen. Uh, it's, um, I don't know, there was the pine beetle thing that took the supply away too, is mm -hmm. uh, still recovering from that. So uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know where the lumber industry is going to end up. It's, uh, it's certainly just, uh, uh, just a mere shadow of what, what it was before. Uh, when I first got into it, people were, uh, they, they would talk about the old days and it was, uh, I thought it was the good old days when I was there, but uh, previously when I got there, uh, some of the uh, guys and the traders in the lumber industry, they'd go, uh, after Friday, they'd go for a few drinks and end up on Monday uh, morning at, uh, at work, be, you know, they just got back from Las Vegas or Reno, or they just hop on a plane and just go. The money was so free-flowing at that time. It was awesome. Wow. Yeah. So... I mean, that's that's changed quite a bit. Um, what about uh, what about your your former company? How's that doing these days? I, I believe it's uh, doing quite well. I've, uh, that's good to hear. I, I, yeah, I uh, I had really my doubts uh, that he could keep it going just because he he made some moves that uh, I thought would really kind of put him under. But 
Uh, he managed to go get through the hard times. Uh, he uh, had some uh, key people that stuck with him, and I think he's doing quite well now. Um, matter of fact, the last time I talked to him, which was about a year, year and a half ago, uh, he was trying to do the same thing that I did, uh, trying to uh, sell it to somebody and mm -hmm. trying to retire. So. Uh, I, uh, he's got no, uh, uh, well he's got one business partner uh, that uh, I guess could, could do that, uh, buy him out, but uh, he didn't have a 50-50 partner, he doesn't right. have, and uh, so, I, and he's uh, dealing with grandkids now like I had to at that time, right. and, uh, which uh, <laughs> is a and, lot, and things change, a lot right? of fun, it's, yeah they do, yeah. Yeah, they do. and uh, no, I, th I think, um, uh, I think he'll do, uh, I think he'll do okay in, in retiring. He's, he's well-grounded, uh, family mm -hmm. guy, and uh, good. I think he'll do well. Yeah. Now, you're a big golfer, so were, what were the other things that kept you sane through all the stressful times of, of your work life? Yeah, the... Uh, uh, and curling, by the way, too. <laughs> <laughs> that only came out later, uh, actually. Uh, my wife started curling again before I did. I, I did it in high school, but uh, she never curled at all, and she took it up and uh, really enjoyed it, so I, I got back into it as well. Uh, golf, and uh, I, uh, uh, I leaned a lot on, uh, on Darlene at that time. I'd go home and uh, I'd scratch my head and wonder where this is gonna go, and uh, during the, uh, those, uh, the gray hair time, when uh, I say the gray hair because uh, my business partner at that time was not uh, being true to his word, and it, it caused me uh, a lot of problems because this was I, I couldn't turn the clock back, and no, uh, that's the way it is. But uh, no, and I, uh, um, I quite often I, uh, I um, laid on you to uh, to give me support, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but you didn't know which way to turn me, but at least <laughs> you were you were a, you were a good sounding board. So uh, well, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing the story because I've always loved the story of, 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 of your career and uh, I'm, I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I, uh, telling the story, it makes me feel, I, I'm, a, I'm not a bragging guy, so this always makes me feel like I'm boasting here, but I'm, I'm not really. I'm just telling you what, it, what happened. No, it's a fantastic story. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us at our website at greggorner.com. That's G-R-E-G-G-O-E-R-N-E-R-T.com. Thanks again.